scratching my head going, okay, this is kind of weird. And uh, at the same time, uh, again, I was, you know, there and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I want to do something for the Lord. And, and so I came up with the idea to produce my very first video, which was really, really not a very good production. But I saw Peter Ruckman's um, manuscript evidence. I think it was called Advanced Manuscript Evidence or something like that. He did a two-part study on VHS when I had originally seen it. It's probably on DVD by now, I'm sure. But I love this thing that he would actually hold up a Bible and he would say, look at that right there, like this. And he'd, he'd show it, you know, he'd show the verse and they'd zoom in on the, on the text. And he was showing, these are the actual books, here's the quotes, boom. And I thought, I like that idea. So I took... A tripod that's sitting here with my recorder, video, my audio recorder on it, and I had a camera, a little cheap JVC camera. I don't, no, I don't think it's in here right now. I have it over in that hallway out there on a shelf. But I took this camera and I would have the camera on my tripod kind of up like this, and I put my white suit or my white uh, dress shirt on, and I'd put the documentation in underneath it and, and things. And I, um, you know, I kept hearing this thing about uh, the NIV removed 60-some thousand verses or words from the King James Bible, and they changed this and they changed that. And I was always going, okay, I'd like to see that documentation. And I looked through all my different books, and nobody provided it. So I don't know if I have it here or not. Um, yeah, here it is. So what I did is I determined in my mind I'm going to look up the... NIV that I had growing up for many, many years, the Today's New International Version uh, that was big at the time, and the King James Bible. I'm going to take my Strong's Concordance and I'm going to look up the word, like uh, the word sanctify. Okay? Um, sanctify in the King James Bible and how the NIV would change it to consecrate or makes them holy, dedicates, honor, keeping it holy. Um, you know, just something like that, or you have a uh, soul, you know. And what I did is I went through over 20,000 references in the King James Bible, NIV, TNIV, according to the Strong's Concordance, all the references to soul. I'd go down through every single one, look up in all three, and then I'd write down what each of the three said. And uh took me a couple months to get that project done. And I would do this while either listening to music or listening to preaching um, on the computer. And then I'd be sitting there with all these different Bibles and Strong's Concordance, and I'd be doing this thing. And um, here's just an example of it right there of the collation work that I did. You can see there the, the three different columns. And um, all in all, I documented 5,000 word perversions in the NIV TNIV. In other words, there's many times that it'll read like the King James, but over 5,000 times that uh, the NIV and the TNIV totally changed the text. And um, here I have in the back, brother versus brother and sister. The TNIV is a gender-inclusive um, translation. They would add and sister. And I show here the Nestle's 27th, the Texas Receptus, the KGV, NIV, TNIV where the TNIV is adding and sister. Again, I documented that. So I have done my own research. Nobody can say, you know, you're just copying things from other people. No, actually, I did my own research. And I came out with that originally in this video from NIV to KJV. And that one there, I came out with while at uh, Liberty Baptist Church. And... Um, yeah, and you can see the difference here. This is the original one, my very first video project, and I had no idea about you know how to use Sony Vegas video editing software or really anything else. I mean, I, I put this thing together. It was terrible, <laughs> the quality. I played my own intro music, which I can't play the piano or anything. I had a keyboard hooked up to the computer, and I played How Firm a Foundation at the beginning. Just dum 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 <laughs> like that. It was bad, and all you ever see the whole way, way through is my hands, 
my hands holding books up and things and showing things and whatever else. Really bad. But uh, actually sent this thing around to different ministries. Uh, sent it to Sam Gipps, sent it to Ken Hoven, Chick Publications, Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger actually sold this video for a little while. And then I finally thought, this is not good. And you can see here on the back, it just shows, you know, some of the things that I covered in the, in the uh, teaching of it. And it just, you know, down there in the corner by Brian Denlinger. All right. So I started learning a little bit more about um, video editing and things like that. I got my first, you know, prosumer, um, you know, professional consumer camera better than the one I had. And uh, I redid it with me actually sitting there and I got my suit and tie on and the whole thing. And I turned it into a two DVD set, um, which is this one from NIV to KJV. And uh, this time I actually came, Lord gave me the idea for the name King James Video Ministries. So King James Video Ministries was formed. I got a PO box in Hopeland, Pennsylvania, not down too far from uh, Kleinfeldersville. And I got my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com, which I still have today. And so that kind of got the ball rolling there. And, and uh, I went from that one to, uh, I don't know if I have a copy of it, Ridiculous Bible Perversions of the New Age. And uh, I think right around that time is when I got on YouTube. It was 2007 when I got started in this whole thing. 2008, I, I you know, got into YouTube. And... Um, yeah, right around that time period. Uh, I guess I still had, I'm trying to think, I think I, I had, I'm trying, trying to think of the, the timing of the whole thing. When I had created the logging, you know, videos and put them on and things like that. I think I just did that originally as a, to show some people that I had done some logging or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen. Sorry if I'm getting some of my, you know, things kind of jumbled up and whatever here. But... I did that while going to Liberty Baptist Church, that one there, and I now had my P.O. box, and I had um, the website and the whole deal. So then I did Ridiculous Bible Perversions of the New Age, put that on YouTube, and then I started working on my biggest video uh, project up to that point, which was the Real Bible Version Issue Exposed, and um, that one... I put out in a number of parts on this channel and since then have put the full thing on my secondary channel in full high definition. So that one took, I think it was about five months if I remember correctly. Again, forgive me if I'm getting some of these numbers mixed up. If you watch an older video and I say it took me three months or something, I'm not trying to give false information here. It's just a lot has happened in the last couple of years. I don't remember the exact dates and things like that, so forgive me if I messed up. But that was a big project for me. I started getting into the thing of graphics and, and professional music and uh, the whole deal, royalty-free music, uh, which I had included some of that in from NIV to KJV. So uh, that was you know, a while ago. I was making these videos and things, getting this stuff out. And um, what happened is we were having these conversations, uh, myself, Derek, Jesse, and we decided we were going to go into the house church and start a house church because, again, we were having problems with the Liberty Baptist Church. They were 501c3. There were some issues there. There were many times we wanted to go out witnessing door-to-door -door type of stuff, and we couldn't because we had to work on the church building, and it was just the politics of the whole church building structure. So we started our house church, and then it was just full out, all out, going out uh, there was because again we weren't allowed to go and, and pass out tracks at Walmart and street preaching was kind of it's okay but don't get yourself in trouble because it'll reflect bad on the church and the, well when we had Bible Believers Fellowship we just did you know pretty much what the Lord told us to do no worries about that and um, we started to you know how are we going to do this what are we going to do we'd meet together we'd study the Bible uh, let's go out let's do some tracting let's we started buying copies of books. We, we would hand out the Sam Gipps answer book up here. Um, David Daniels uh, 
Did the Catholic Church give us the Bible? We would have that. Actually, right there it is still. The Before we were even Bible Believers Fellowship, we would just use King James Video Ministries um, as our house church contact info. And then we came up with Bible Believers Fellowship, kind of separated the two, and, um, and got a separate website. It was kjvbbf.com. And that has since been taken down because I let Jesse and his wife have it after I got married and, and uh, we moved away. So um, we were going out. We were doing a lot of door-to-door -door type of stuff. Uh, again, early video, you can see us out going door-to-door. -door. Um, the three of us, myself, Jesse, Derek, and we would go out. And uh, we, would, we were getting into this thing of, okay, we're a lot of times wasting time arguing with people and things like this. So we thought... Um, instead of us just going out and knocking on the door and getting into a conversation and, you know, whatever else, we can do that sometimes if the people are out, we'll do that. But let's just go and just, we'll just get information out. So we got these door hanging bags and we were giving out Ruckman's, uh, you know, Millions Disappear booklet. I don't know if, I'm sure I have one someplace, but uh, um, not important. Uh, the whole point is we were getting out, you know, we were, I mean, I'm, I had this big box and I'd take this big box with me, you know, and, and I'd be like the pack mule and I'm, and I'm walking down this, the center of the development or whatever, down in, along the street or whatever. And, and, you know, Jesse's doing this side of the street and Derek's doing that side of the street and go and hang him on, on doors and whatever. And if somebody would be out and you know, he'd start talking and the two of us would walk over and, and, you know, I'd be carrying the big box and I'd hand it to, you know, here's some more, here you go. Here you go, and we do, you know, we were just doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, I mean, it was up into the thousands, you know, of things that we did, getting out this information. And uh, I would, I'd spend my week, you know, and, and we were also giving out uh, Ken Hovind's um, 100 Reasons, I think it was, Why Evolution is Stupid. We were giving out those DVDs, making all these copies of the DVDs. So we had a um, DVD duplicator, a little one to one you put in the master and then the copy and we do that so i'd spend my week just studying still you know listening to sermons and studying while the dvds are burning and using my computer as well so it's a really slow process we ended up buying a big one to eleven i think it is um dvd duplicating tower it can do like 11 dvds at the same time sitting right over there and um so you know, we're doing that, and then I, of course, would use it when I'd have an order come in uh, from Gail Ripplinger for my DVDs, like this. Uh, of course, I was selling them on my website at that time, too. So I was, you know, making a little bit of money from that, and and uh, it was a lot of work, very time-intensive. I did the whole thing myself. I printed the paper, uh, the, the cover here. I um, burned the DVDs. I printed the artwork on the DVD. I had printers that could do that. Um, I shrink wrapped them, did the heat gun thing, all the deal. Uh, never had anybody else produce my DVDs. So, um, trying to think. So we did that for a long time, and we had some very interesting contacts and things, ministry contacts. And uh, one of those interesting ministry contacts was my wife. And when she contacted me, she was in kind of that phase right before salvation where she was really starting to have a strong desire for the truth. And she was big time into the InfoWars thing, which I was at that time as well. Um, not that I believed everything Alex Jones was saying, but I could, you know, was like into the prophecy thing and the end times, new world order stuff. And, and uh, so she contacted me and she asked me a few questions and, and um, I wrote back to her and I'm like, you know, I had no idea, you know, I just see this name and I'm thinking, okay, is she an old woman? Is she young? Is she married? Is she divorced or a Satanist or whatever? <laughs> and I remember her email at the time was Brainiac Spook. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little bit freaked out here by the, the you know, spook thing. You know, is this some kind of government intelligence, you know, person that's trying to like, whatever here, they're going to assassinate me or something, <laughs> you know? And uh, she was in that field, by the way, too, by, you know, military intelligence. She was trained um, in military intelligence, has, you know, uh, different certificates from the FBI even. 
and um, in the military intelligence thing uh, as a lost woman. And at the time, she was a, she had, was, uh, I think when she first started writing to me, she was in the process of leaving um, a school she was going to. She was living in Boston at the time. And she was leaving there, or had left, and going back to Iowa. And then she was staying with her parents. And, um, and so she started to find out about the Bible issue and whatever else. Found my ministry and contacted me saying, you know, she wanted to join a, a Bible-believing ministry. And I just was kind of like, okay, are you saved? You know, and I wrote to her and I said, if you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? Do you know? And she wrote back and she said, I'd be in hell. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, you know, because I've dealt with people for so long, you know, you get the, they just, they don't come right out and say it. I met very few people on the street that ever came out and said, yeah, I'm going to hell. You know, um, most of them, it was, I think I'll go to heaven, you know, when I die. And she just, I'd go to hell. I know I would. And so, told her how to get saved and, and uh, I didn't call her on the phone or lead her into some prayer or whatever else. I just, this is what you need to do to get saved. And uh, I forget how long it was till I heard from her again. And, and um, she's, you know, the Lord saved me. And, and you know, I, I'm, I bought a bunch of books and I'm studying this and I'm studying that and things. And, and how do you witness to people and things? I said, well, try some gospel tracts. I'll send you some. And so I sent her some of our gospel tracts that we would hand out and things. Just a mix of some of uh, Terry Watkins' uh, little trifold pamphlets on different issues, and some chick tracks, and I don't think I was had any fellowship track league tracks at the time, but you know some of the stuff we hand out. And so she's she writes back and oh hey I I went out to this Catholic church and I'm handing them out out there and I'm out doing this and I'm out doing that and things and really you know so we start writing back and forth and and uh, you know. Finally, I realized, you know, this is a single, you know, young woman. And um, she had a couple sermon requests and things, and I did those and whatever. And, and uh, we decided, you know, would you like to talk on Skype? And she was a little bit, yeah, you know, I'm not really big on Skype thing. And I said, you know, well, how, what else can we do and whatever? And okay, fine. So we start talking on Skype, and it was like, oh, we'll just talk just for a few minutes. I think it was like three or four hours the first night we talked. <laughs> just, you know, just talking like crazy. And and uh, just this amazing, amazing desire for truth, unlike anybody I'd ever seen before. And just, you know, the Lord was doing things through her and for her. And that, that change that was there from what she was telling me she was in her past, what she shared a little bit of it in different videos. And I'm just going... Because I had been told for years, you know, people, oh, you know, you ought to get, you know, find a girl and get married and all this other stuff. And and I'd heard, you know, Ruckman's thing on segregation versus integration. And I started realizing, oh, you know, I shouldn't have been going after those Spanish girls. And praise Lord, I'd gotten victory over pornography a long time before meeting Catherine. And um, so, uh, you know, I'm thinking I'd like to meet, and I'd tell people I'd like to meet a German girl that's really into the truth like I am and stuff, and people would be like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to have your beliefs. Nobody's going to think the way you do and and whatever. And uh, talking to her, emailing back and forth quite a bit, writing a lot of letters back and forth. Um, looking over this way, I think I had the letters over here somewhere on the shelf, but <laughs> um, wouldn't matter because I'm not going to show them in detail anyhow, but uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we talked on Skype and I'm just going, uh, this is the woman I've been looking for. And I've been praying. I mean, I prayed fervently. I remember um, a passage in, uh, I think it's Proverbs 18, 21. Let me look it up real quick. Good advice for you if you're single, by the way. Um, I do believe that a, a Christian that's single uh, should use their single life to serve the Lord. But I think you should always be open to God's leading um, for you to find um, you know, a wife if you're a man or a husband if you're a woman. I don't think that uh, being a single Christian um, is all that great. I mean, the Bible says it's not good for the man to be alone. God made a helpmeet for him. Uh, 
Now, if that was true in the Garden of Eden, I think it's very true for today. So, Proverbs 18, verse 22, and I'd pray this verse over and over again. I'd remind the Lord, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Okay, Lord, you're using me in ministry. You're helping me to get these videos done and everything else, but I don't have a wife. Every time I try to meet one or whatever else, it just does not work out. Please, God, give me a wife. Please give me a wife. Your word says, and I'd remind him over and over again. <laughs> so I got done talking to Catherine that night, and I said, remember I went over and I just, you know, laying there awake, and it was like, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning or something until we got done talking. And uh, I said, Lord, I think that I think she's the one. I think this is the woman that um, that I could spend the rest of my life with. And, and my prayer up to that point had been, I realize either one of two things is going to happen if I meet a woman. Number one, I'm going to marry a woman and she's absolutely going to destroy my ministry. Um, because actually, i got to tell this story. There was a, um, I think a Mennonite or something like this, or some kind of a spinoff of the Mennonites or some kind of brethren Mennonite, charity ministry, something like that, from down south. And uh, they had two daughters. And um, and this mother was like, you know, my two daughters, would you be interested in one of them and stuff? Because Mennonites are very big on the thing of setting up their children with marriage. And I thought, hey, this would be great. Conservative, she's, you know, wears modest apparel, the whole deal. And um, so I said, yeah, you know, that, that'd be fun. And, and she said, well, you know, I'll give my daughters your information and they can, you know, check into who you are and whatever else and and things. Both daughters rejected me. <laughs> Both of them were like, he's too militant, you know. And I tried Christian singles websites and the whole thing, stupid nonsense, you know. And it just, it was always just like, you're too militant, you're too militant. And so people were telling me, you know, I have to lower my standards, you know, to find a wife. And I'm like, I'm not doing it, not going to do it. And I thought, if I meet a woman, she's either going to lie to me, you know, to become my wife, and then she's going to wreck the ministry, or, and this will be the rare one, I'll find a woman that can work with me in the ministry. Because, it, you know, I was never, I was able to work with some of the brethren and things over the years, some brothers in Christ, but it was, it was never like I really didn't click completely in my mind with them. And uh, so I see... Catherine, we're talking, and I'm thinking, this is the first woman. I'm just having, like, total fellowship with her uh, after just, you know, writing back and forth for a couple months and then our first actual conversation uh, on Skype. And so I'm just, I'm, I remember saying, okay, Lord, if, if she's the one, just, I don't ask for signs because a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and I, I understand that, but just let me know some way, shape, or form. So we scheduled it, you know, we'll talk tomorrow night, you know, on Skype. So a time came to talk to her and comes on and she's sitting there and for years and years and years, going way back to when I was little, you've seen the pictures, I loved flannel shirts. And um, I always liked the red and black buffalo plaid, you know, the Paul Bunyan looking shirt and whatever else. And Catherine comes on and she has got a red and black buffalo plaid dress on <laughs> and I'm just like well okay you know I didn't tell her that I didn't say anything about that and again tremendous fellowship and things and so we're getting on to the end of the conversation and I said you know um I have something I need to ask you and she kind of smiled you know <laughs> she's already reading my mind before we even you know officially got married and I said uh I could kind of lead up to this and whatever else, but I don't do that. I'm just going to be blunt and just honest with you. Would you want to be my wife? And she smiled and she said, yes. So um, we had met, I guess, in October of, uh, boy, I can, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble if I don't remember this. Um, I think it was 2011, and we were married in 2012, May of 2012. So went out to get her out in Iowa um, from her parents' place and moved as much stuff as we could back. At the time, I was still at my parents' place, so we moved her things in there and just kind of like, okay, where are we going to go? Just kind of restructuring there, but just it was a bad situation out there with her parents at the time. Praise the Lord, actually, all you out there that have been praying for her parents and that relationship there. Her parents are really, um, there's a lot better fellowship now. Uh, 
the fellowship's been restored between her parents and Catherine and myself. So uh, it's pretty neat. Um, and so, uh, so I went out there at the time, needed to go out and get her and things. And, and so brought her back to my parents' place. I'm going, okay, now what do we do? Uh, should we look for an apartment? I wanted to show her northern Pennsylvania. So we went on our honeymoon up to the Poconos area, which was not really the area I liked. I was more the Tioga, Potter County area, uh, a little bit farther west, northwest of um, the Poconos area. And uh, so we were we were there and, and, you know, just getting to know each other and, and things better and, and uh, you know, and actually had the chance to baptize my wife. So because she had gotten saved and nobody had ever baptized her, so I baptized her. And so you know, while we were in this whole situation, we were contacted by some people from Tioga County, and they said, you know, would you like to come up? You know, we've been listening to some of your stuff, and they bought originally had bought some uh, DVDs um, from Gail Ripplinger, and they wanted to know who this guy is and whatever else. So uh, we went up to see them, for a weekend, and they put us in contact with um, Country Chapel Baptist Church in Eldred, Pennsylvania, uh, McKean County, which is farther out west, towards Lake Erie. And uh, so we went there, and, and they said, there's this old house that uh, is abandoned, essentially, right now. And uh, nobody's been living there for a while. And if you two could come and help us out at our shop, at our store, they had bought an old school, and they had, uh, they were making the whole one end of the school into a like an antique place, antique sales and country type store, huge big part of the store. And if you could help us out with, you know, me with my video work and Catherine with her ability to build websites and things, help build the website, help do video and things like that, help out there, and then also help out with preaching and teaching the Bible at Country Chapel. In other words, I'd be like almost like an assistant pastor essentially. So we thought it was a good situation. We need a place to live. So this would be a great place where I can exchange my work and I can also continue the ministry. So, okay, we'll do this. So we moved up to this place. Again, I'll be showing pictures there. And it um, looks like a decent place, but it was, it was really, really bad. There was no insulation at all in the walls. It was ridiculous in the wintertime. The area where we had our wood stove, um, we'd get that room up to 95 degrees and literally... Uh, you go out the hallway about maybe five feet this way and turn where we had our computers at. It would be 95 degrees in that room and about seven or eight feet away in another room, it was 50 degrees. <laughs> That's how badly insulated the place was. Um, while we were in bed, you'd hear mice running on the floor, you know, the wood floor, you know, and stuff like this. And the one night we're there sleeping, I remember, and, this, and all of a sudden they, it was drop ceilings in the place and this like you know just making all this noise and i'm going you know i thought somebody was breaking in the house so i'm jumping up out of bed you know what's going on she's up and we're going what is this what is this you know getting lights on and and there was a bat that had gotten up into the drop ceiling and that thing's flying all over the place up there so i had to pop up the one drop ceiling thing take a towel and grab the bat you know and and uh get him outside and things and Another time I walked down into the basement and there was a big starling down there flying around and uh, just about hit me, you know. So I walked down and there was fairly dark and the toilet was always backing up. The, the Literally the, the, the toilet, the pipe, you know, the waste pipe went outside into a ditch outside. So you walk outside and there's raw sewage out there. I mean the place was in really, really bad shape. And the water, again I'll, I'll be showing pictures of all this stuff. The water in the place, uh, it, was, it was in the whole, we called it gas land, actually, affectionately, um, because it was a lot of the area where they had drilled back in the 1960s, um, the Marcellus Shale up there, they'd get the, the gas out of it and everything else, and they totally destroyed the water system, the whole water table in the area. is just totally toxic, and it was just filled with uh, um, sulfur and rust and all kinds of wonderful stuff. I mean, the water just smelled horrible. Um, you could not drink it. Um, I mean, we were always cleaning the shower, turn the shower, the white shower walls, just turn them, you know, yellow and orange. Uh, you'd, you'd, you know, pour some water into a 
container and it would look clear and within a couple of minutes it would literally you'd sit there you could watch it it would turn yellow um, really bad and uh, my wife's hair was falling out I mean it was it was not good so this this we thought this was this great situation it turned out no actually it wasn't that great and uh, before we had moved in I talked to the pastor Bruce Ireland was his name and I said if we come up to this place I don't want to be like okay we're here and now all of a sudden we got to move right away and what's the deal? And um, and it was the guy's name was Avery, last name of Avery that owned this place. And it was his parents' place. And then he was on he you know, he'd gotten it through the will. And then you know when his parents passed away, and then the Bruce Ireland and his wife had fixed this place up for him because they needed a place to stay. So they moved in. They were living right down the road. And uh, so he said, "Oh no, you know there's no plans." Um, this Avery guy, he doesn't, you know, he just, if somebody's living there and taking care of the place, he's happy, you know, and, and, uh, you know, so there's no plans there. And I said, what about your children? Oh, no, there's nothing there. There's nothing, you know, you'll, you'll be fine. You can stay there indefinitely, uh, just exchanging your work for rent, essentially. And I would pay the, all the utility bills for the place. It's just, you know, it was an abandoned house. They had, you know, access to it just to take care of it, to watch over it and stuff like that. So, Okay, fine. So um, we were there. Again, the whole faithful attendance and stuff like that. Um, I had I knew better than the whole church building thing, but I was still kind of a little bit on the fence over, if you listen to my old Bible Believers Fellowship studies, I'll say, there's still good church buildings out there and the whole thing. And, um, and I was saying that because I never had experience with an actual guy that professed to believe the King James Bible pastoring a church. Well, Bruce Ireland was the first one that I saw like that. He never corrected it with the Greek or the Hebrew or whatever else, you know. So, but again, I started to see the the politics and the the whole thing of the church building thing again, and it was kind of a, uh, you know, and it was it was not the best for our marriage, and you know, we're trying to get to know each other and stuff, trying to, you know, what do you, what do you want to do here, and and you know, do you want to go out shopping today, and you know, why don't we, you know, she's my wife's trying to. You know, she never really cooked much because she was just a single career woman for many years before she got married. And so she's trying to make recipes. And right in the middle of that, phone rings. Hey, could you come down to the shops to do video? Or could you come down to help with this? Or, you know, and so, yeah, we're staying here. But we were like, we started feeling like we we're indentured slaves. You know, like we owe them everything and our time and whatever else. I mean, we just haven't been married that long. So, you know, the stress level started to build. And, but we were just hanging in there and whatever else. Uh, Christmas time came around of 2012 and, um, and we went down to see my parents in Lancaster County and then came back up after the Christmas vacation thing. And, um, and I remember uh, we were there and we were doing the whole, th you know, there at the church, you know, uh, being part of the ministry and everything else. And uh, um, when we would go over to the Ireland's place um, on Sunday afternoons and things. And, and I remember uh, we went in the one time and he said, hey, he said, brother, he said, I need to talk to you about something. Oh, yeah, okay, you know, and stuff. And, and it was just like this little bit of an uneasy, like, uh-oh, there's a bomb that's going to drop. And so I'm thinking, okay, and there wasn't any kind of bad, you know, feelings or anything there. I was just, you know, whatever. We were getting along, I thought. So we go downstairs, and he takes me down to the basement, and he says, uh, hey, uh, um, my daughter and her husband, they, they uh, are selling their place out in Ohio, and they need a place to come to. And uh, I kind of told them that they could have the, the place that you're staying at. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's not definite yet, not totally for sure, but, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to find another place to live. And I was supposed to preach that night, you know, I'm just going to be preaching Sunday night service. And it was just like I got hit in the stomach because I'm going, you know, what? You know, because we were just, I mean, we were just, you know, like I said, newly married. We were not real well off financially. I couldn't just, oh, I'll just go buy something else. And I just, I mean, it was just like the wind got knocked out of my sails. I mean, just, I mean, just really like my spirit was broken. I mean, I just. I just did not know what to do, and I'm thinking, what on earth am I going to do? And, and I, you know, 
went and I just stumbled my way through the sermon. I did a horrible job and and uh, just I didn't know what to say and and whatever and you know of course told Catherine about it and she's going what are we going to do and and so we start talking what are we going to do about this and and uh, things started heading downhill again and and you know and it was funny because I remember. Um, Occasionally, we'd listen to a lot of Ruckman stuff while we'd be eating supper or making food, you know, or whatever. And and uh, I remember the one night um, we had my own sermons on there from Bible Believers Fellowship because she hadn't heard a lot of them. So I'd say, you know, you want to hear this one? And so I put on my, my study on no local church. And we were listening to it, and, you know, I was, I was saying about the church buildings are unscriptural and whatever, and... and um, I remember it was just like we both kind of looked at each other and, and we're thinking, you know, I think that's what we're missing here. Uh, we shouldn't be in a church building. And so uh, contacted my parents and I said, would it be okay? I mean, we have no place to go right now. We don't have you know, very much money and we have to move. We have to leave. We're being forced out of this place after being told. And I actually went and I, I confronted Bruce on that and I said, hey, you, you told me that we weren't going to be kicked out of here. And he said, and he actually cried at that time. Um, and he said, he said, I lied to you. I'm sorry. I said, yeah, we always promised it to our children if they wanted it and our children come before you. So I'm, I lied to you. I'm sorry about that. At least he was honest, I guess. But uh, so I called my parents and I said, can we put our stuff there? And, and you know, we're, we'll live in, in my old wood shop. I'll come down and I'll sell my, a lot of my woodworking equipment and things. We need the money. And, uh, you know, would that be okay? And my dad said, yeah, you know, you can put your stuff there in, in the shed and we'll put some other things out in the garage and whatever else, we'll put your stuff around and, and uh, you can, you know, live in your old wood shop. It was 16 foot by 16 foot. And we lived there over the summer of 2013. And again, you can see a lot of these videos. You know, if you go back through my video history, you can see uh, when I talked about, you know, I'm standing out in front of the house where we were staying, this old house in northern Pennsylvania, and I'm talking about, you know, please pray for us and things. And, and uh, you know, so we got things packed up into a big Penske truck as much as we could, and we started to leave some things there. But um, I had a, a 2009 KLR 650 Kawasaki motorcycle that uh, I'll be talking more about that in my study on motorcycles and things like that and uh, that was like a secondary vehicle to the truck that we had and uh, that was the only other vehicle we had my pickup truck and my motorcycle at the time so I put that in the back of the Penske truck figuring okay we'll drive down to Pennsylvania early early morning unload everything um, and I think yeah we unloaded everything and we went back the same night so it was like it was a long trip it was like a five hour trip down and uh, I think or do we can't remember if we unloaded everything that day or the next day whatever but we went down and we came back up pretty much you know really really quickly so um, that's what we did and I remember we we're, were driving along and we got to talk about the thing the house church thing and what are we going to do the ministry plans for the future and where we're going to live and whatever else and I remember I said to my wife you know what would happen because up until that point in time, the only videos I had done were my DVDs. These DVDs were the only thing I had done. And all the other preaching I had done was all audio sermons, sermon audio and things. And I'd done a few little bits and stuff and showed, you know, I, I videotaped some of the preaching I did at, at Country Chapel Baptist Church. And again, you can find those old videos. And I said, what would happen if I started preaching uh, sermons but putting them out on YouTube as videos. And she was, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. So moved back down to my parents' property and we were staying in the 16 foot by 16 foot wood shop of mine. I cleaned all the stuff out. We, you know, put in our stove and our refrigerator and, you know, the bed and the a table, you know, and I put up a little laundry tub for a sink and, you know, running water was a blue jug that you tip over and turn the thing on. You know, and uh, we lived like that for, um, you know, probably about six or seven months, something like that, uh, through the summer. And we actually drove out to Iowa to her parents' place 
to get some more of her things. And uh, she had a cat that was out there that she'd had for years and years named Casey. And so we brought Casey back with us and, and uh, quite a few adventures with that, you know. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, um, we, uh, so we were living there and got all of our stuff out of country, Chapel Baptist Church. But take my, we got the KLR out of the back of the Penske truck, rode it back up to, to Northern PA. I remember it was like, you know, probably right around freezing till we got back to the, you know, the house where we were staying. And it was so cold. I remember we're just like, you know, if you ever rode like in really, really cold temperatures, you're just kind of like, oh, uh, like, you know, you want to move, but that just means more wind hitting you and you're just kind of tucked in as close as you can get yourself to the motorcycle and you're kind of have your head, your helmet down underneath, you know, the visor as much as you can trying to keep the wind off of you and your hands are just like frozen, <laughs> you know, it was a cold ride, but we got back. Uh, got the rest of our stuff out of there, moved out, and I remember I took the keys back to the place and handed them to, to Bruce Ireland, and he was just like, okay. And didn't say, hey, you know, God be with you or anything else, just meh, whatever, totally cold. After being there for nearly a year and serving with him in his church and things. And uh, we had a big blow-up argument and stuff too, but, you know, whatever, I was like, you know, I'd have forgiven and whatever, hey, you know, I shook his hand or whatever, but he didn't want to shake hands, so... Whatever. So we're down there in uh, Lancaster County, and uh, that's where a lot of the videos are of me up on top of the hill. Well, that's the property that my parents own, and you can see the power line behind me. You can see the big high tension power lines, and um, I did I did a lot of different studies there and things. And so I would be doing my preaching and teaching uh, in video form, putting them out on YouTube. That's when that whole thing started. And I realized, you know, I'd rather get, you know, just put my videos out there for free, put the DVDs online, they're free to people to watch, and then I'm just going to spend my time preaching and teaching the Word of God for free. Uh, and so I closed down my web store, um, and I had the donation thing there, and people would donate to the ministry. I appreciate that. And uh, we started to try and build up our finances to be able to purchase some place, and we looked in... Virginia, we looked in West Virginia, uh, we looked in all throughout Pennsylvania, took a lot of drives, where do you want to live, and and a lot of day trips and things. I sold a lot of my uh, equipment from when I was a wood turner, uh, which is kind of hard, you know, selling some of my wood lathes and things like that. Um, I had a really nice Powermatic wood lathe, and I sold that. I had a big custom wood lathe. There's actually a video of that earlier on in my different videos of me turning this big perpendicular wood turning thing. I sold that lathe uh, after having it custom built. Um, again, hard decision, but we had to have money. And the real heartbreaker was I had to sell my motorcycle, um, which really meant a lot to me. That was a very special bike to me. Um, had a lot of happy memories on that bike. Um, so again, I'll, I'll talk more about that in the other study. but. Uh, we were just doing everything we could, selling anything we didn't need, really kind of trying to downsize and and um, save up as much money as we could, live as cheaply as we could. That's why we were living in a wood shop, old old uh, wood shop, just a small little place to live in, and um, just really tried to you know save our money. And we we had no idea at all where we were going to be moving. And one of our viewers from the state of Maine actually wrote and said, uh, why don't you consider northern Maine, or the state of Maine, you know. And I'm going, Maine? What? You know, I mean, we're Pennsylvania, southern, southeastern Pennsylvania, we're going to go the whole way to Maine? You know, like, are you crazy? It's just like, it snows all the time there, and it's freezing cold, and it just, this barren wasteland up there, there's, you know, nothing at all, and we, you know, one of the big things my wife and I liked was going out and picking wild edibles, wild raspberries, and things like that, and and uh, herbs and whatever else that we could find in the wild, and really getting into that. And I'm thinking Maine ain't gonna have any of that stuff. I mean, it's just like this total frozen north up there. It probably doesn't even, you know, you probably don't even have green grass in northern Maine, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, oh, okay, you know, I'll just start looking. So I start looking up properties, and and I'm going wow, this is actually a beautiful place up there. It's really, really kind of nice and, and uh, pretty good affordable properties. 
And so I said something to my wife, and I said, you know, what do you think? You want to go up to Maine? And she said, well, it's kind of interesting you say that because uh, a guy that she had been dating a long, long time ago, I think she was either dating or just a friend or I'm not sure, but she, no, she was dating. And she said the one time, she said, I'd like to go on a road trip to Maine. And he was like, Maine? I'm not going to Maine, you know. And, and so she kind of forgot about it. And here, all these years later, she marries me and I'm like, let's go on a road trip to Maine. So she's like, yeah, let's go. That'd be great. So we loaded uh, our cat in the back in a carrier and things and, and loaded up our stuff and in my old truck. And we drove to Maine. Uh, I think it was like 18-hour drive. And uh, drove up here. Um, started out early in the morning, drove the whole way up, and uh, decided to look at some properties. And we looked at, you know, we were thinking, you know, well, we don't have money for a house. Um, so we thought, well, we'd like to have some land, some some nice, you know, remote type of land and whatever else, and we can build something on it. And, you know, we were perfectly content to just, you know, build something small. I mean, we were living in a 16-foot by 16-foot, you know, wood shop at the time. And so really didn't need that much. And I had a wood stove and I had a generator and a bunch of other things. I thought, you know, we can do this. So that was in uh, September that we did that. And uh, so it's still pretty warm here in Maine. And we were like, hey, this is nice. And at night it was like, wow, it's kind of kind of cool here. But, you know, really a lot of vegetation. And really this actually looks pretty good. So we found a property in Littleton. And uh, we decided we would purchase the property. I offered less than what the guy was asking, and he said, yeah, okay, I'll sell it for that. And the whole debacle of that whole thing, I look back at that now and realize it was a big mistake because there was a right-of-way getting back to our property. Don't ever buy a property that has a right-of-way going back to it. And so um, that's what we did. Um, bought this land, and we moved, or we went back down to Pennsylvania because we were still had our stuff down there. And I said, okay, now what are we going to do? How are we going to get our stuff up there? And I, I said, well, you know, we'll just go we'll live on the property and then we'll have to get an office in town to run the ministry. And, well, yeah, but there's issues with that and things back and forth. And eh, I don't know. And how are we going to get something built in time before winter hits up there? And, yeah, that's true, you know, and, and things. And we had the closing date was later. So it was October when the closing date was for our property. So we came back up in October for the closing date. And um, we were kind of, you know, we just kind of hung out and went around and we did some kayaking on the one lake, uh, Drew's Lake. And uh, we stayed at a little, like, Tall Timbers Lodge, I think it's called. Stayed there and uh, just kind of sightseeing in the area and things like that, getting to know the area a little bit. And, um, and went back down to Pennsylvania again. And we're down there, and it was like, okay, are we going to be able to stay down here and just go up in the spring and start building? Well, I uh, had some family issues there and some arguments and things were, you know, coming up, which, you know, living there on my parents' property, that was kind of bound to happen. And uh, so we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Should we try to rent someplace up there? Nah, it's just throwing money away, whatever. We still had some money left over. Um, and because I'll just, I'll just tell you, we spent 18,000 on our property, on our land that we had. And, uh, so I said at that time, I still had my KLR 650 and I said, well, why don't we sell the motorcycle and we can scrape together some more money, sold the motorcycle and just phew, tough thing for me. Cause that bike meant a lot. We you know, used a lot for secondary transportation. So, um, came back up uh, in November, yeah, November, because we were here for Thanksgiving. So we came back up. There was no snow that year, um, but it was really cold. I remember that. And we wanted to go back to our property and just kind of hang out there, because we had bought kayaks when we came up in October to do the finish closing for our property. And we took the kayaks back. There was a little, like, wall tent looking thing. <clears throat> back there on the property it was just old you know logs and then an old canvas tarp stretched over the top stuck our kayaks in there so we wanted to go back and hang out at our property
but the bridge blew out and, and the drunken neighbor wasn't about to fix it, you know, too lazy and too drunk. And so we couldn't get back to our property, but we came up with the intent of looking at maybe an old house. Is there some old house that we could find? So we came up and we looked at this place here and uh, they were asking like, I think it was right around $20,000 for it. We paid 16,000 for it and uh, I offered 12,000 and they said, no, they have to go to 16 because they're going into foreclosure and that's what the bank needs and the blah, blah, blah. So, uh, okay, sure. So, you know, I mean, we spent just about every cent that we had at that point in time. Uh, and believe me, we had to sell a lot of stuff to get to that level. But um, so, okay, we bought the place uh, Thanksgiving and they said they can't settle until uh, January 15th, I think it was of 2014 okay yeah because it was 2013 when we first came up 2014 is when they can settle okay so talk to the realtor and stuff and i said you know we can move our stuff in then on that date yep you can move your stuff in we'll give you the keys and the whole deal and they, they'll have all their stuff out of there all you know yeah though everything's out pretty much already because they, they just had left this place um, it was a, it was an ironic, it was kind of funny cause I got to tell this story too. Um, when we were down in Pennsylvania, the, the house, that old rickety place we were staying in, in, in Eldred, Pennsylvania, it was the Avery place. And we would pray a lot of times because there again, Bruce Ireland had told us that we could actually buy the place. And so we were praying about the money to buy the Avery place. Well, lo and behold, this very house that I'm standing in here was owned by a woman named Avery. So. Lord answers prayers, uh, just uh, took him a little bit longer and had us come here. But um, so the situation was that there was a, it was a divorce situation here and this guy was trying to fix this place up. So he had a lot of the plaster torn off the old lath. You've probably seen it in some of the videos out here in the hallway. Um, this room here, the drywall is still unfinished up here. And, I thought, well, whatever, it doesn't matter because we're just going to use it for the ministry. We're just going to stay there for the remainder of the winter of 2014, 2014 summer, spring, summer, fall. We'll get our place built back at our property. The lane will be fixed going back in and we'll just use this for the ministry. We're, you know, 13 miles from here to the place and to our property in Littleton. That was the plan. So, um, uh, we moved in here in January, and uh, I remember um, when we came here, when we first looked at the place, everything was still functioning and whatever else, um, but they never turned off. When they left here, they just walked away, and they had a lot of their stuff here yet, and I thought that they were going to be moving it out. That's why I said make sure it's all moved out, and the realtor was like, well, it is. They just walked away from the place, and they left some of their furniture and other things and so it was kind of weird but uh so i thought oh you know okay whatever come up here they never shut the water off in the pipes and so all the pipes had burst so we had no heat at all in january northern maine okay the snow outside was about you know that deep and um and it was you know it'd been a pretty bad winter up until that point in time kind of like this winter it's been very cold and a lot of snow and so I'm going like, what are we going to do? Thankfully, the neighbor snow blowed out our lane for us because I didn't have anything, any way to, to clean it out. I didn't even have a snow shovel at that time. And so we moved our stuff in. Um, just kind of used it as storage at first. And uh, I had to rewire the wiring downstairs to, to hook, put our um, electric cook stove down there. And, and um, But, I mean, it was, it was 18 degrees a lot of times Fahrenheit in the kitchen when I'd be cooking down there or when, you know, Catherine would try to cook and you trying to do, I mean, try to do dishes, you know, with, with, uh, you know, 18 degrees. I mean, our, our dish soap was frozen a lot of times to try to heat that up. And, uh, the way we got water is, uh, our, when there's a spring down in the basement of this place, you lift a plywood cover up and, and I've shown video of it and you lift a cover up and there's a stone hole going down in there's a spring spring water down there so thankfully we did have a source of water but it was really cold living in this place 
but we kind of got back on our feet. In early videos, you'll see me. I got, I'm all dressed up in sweater and winter hat and everything else because uh, we really didn't have much heat other than just electric heaters in different rooms and um, just a lot of different interesting things. And uh, I remember um, we realized at some point in time then that uh, Catherine was with child. And so, you know, that there's a whole story there too that, you know, as well, we decided that we weren't going to go the hospital route. Uh, no ultrasound, no doctor's visits, checkups, anything else. And so summertime came around. Uh, we finally got running water, got our plumbing system fixed here. The plumber, you know, told me, he said, uh, I wouldn't even try to fix this heat system here. I just tear all the copper pipes out, get rid of the old oil furnace. He said the thing's cracked anyhow. Uh, the water that was in it just cracked it. It shot. Uh, he said, you're just going to have to get a whole new system. So I thought, well, I can put off the heat at least for the summer months, the spring and summer and into the fall. But I got the water system fixed here. So uh, thankfully, it's all just one down in the one corner of the house there, the kitchen and the bathroom. And uh, that's, that's it for water. There's nothing upstairs here. So um, Catherine found out that she was with child. We decided we're going to have a natural childbirth. Uh, which we did. The Lord helped us with that. Uh, Oliver was born right downstairs. And this whole time, I'm doing videos. If you look at the videos and you see the creek behind me and, you know, really beautiful scenery, uh, that was over at the right of way going back to our property in Littleton. And just dealing with the neighbor over there. And it was always, it was his responsibility to keep the right of way open, and he never did. Uh, it was just always like pulling teeth with the guy. He was always drunk. He was a Roman Catholic, had a uh, filthy mouth, just a terrible neighbor. Um, again, finally had a chance to witness to him when he was sober. He rejected Jesus Christ, rejected the gospel plainly right to my face, and I told him he was going to go to hell, and he did a couple months later. Died in his own vomit. So uh, then we ended up selling the property, and again, most of you, you've been following the ministry, you know all these different trials that we've been through. And uh, so... Um, you know, the this past year when we sold, you know, 2017, sold the property, bought a new property, and uh, right now the plans are that we're building down there as we can. Right now, of course, we can't because it's a lot of snow and things, and and uh, I got to try to get um, a plow blade on the front of my truck. I got to I got to hook that up and everything else, and try to get down there um, and plow that open and try to get back in and, and resume building. But we've had to take some time off from doing that. And uh, right now the plans for the ministry is eventually we'll be living down that way. But this is going to remain the ministry headquarters for a while till we can afford another place down there closer to the property because the property does not have electricity. Um, so, and you say, why are you doing that? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Why would you buy property that doesn't have electric when you're in video ministry? Well, because I don't think I'm going to be in video ministry my whole life. Uh, I can see the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, about YouTube and uh, the Internet in general and things. So, um, and it's cheaper, quite frankly, it's cheaper. We can't afford, um, again, I'll, I'll just tell another little thing here that went on this past year in 2017. Uh, I'm very much against being in debt, but I thought, well, I prayed about it. I said, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to at least go see if I can get a mortgage. And uh, the Lord turned that down. And I don't know why it happened. Well, I, I do know why now, because it wasn't his will, but it just didn't make any sense. I mean, even the people at the bank are going, I don't know why you were rejected for the mortgage thing. And they're going, this doesn't even make any sense. You know, the, what you wanted to borrow was, you know, well within your means to pay off and whatever else. And it got rejected. It was Lord, plain and simple. So with the money that we had from the sale of our property and Again, another thing I would do occasionally is I'd buy a vehicle and fix it up and sell it, make a little bit of money. And um, uh, so we had money that we were saving up and saving up and saving up, bought our new property, no right of way this time, praise the Lord. And uh, so uh, it's, it's an hour and a half south of here, uh, here in Bridgewater. And um, so that's the ministry. That's how I came to know the Lord and what the Lord's done since then. 
And it just shocks me sometimes to think of all the Lord has done with this ministry. And I've, I've said this in other videos. I literally, when the Lord called me into the ministry and said, I want you to be that guy out there fighting this stuff. Um, I remember I thought to myself, okay, well, I don't really think that this is the calling that God has for my life. I don't, this is just kind of like him testing me. Kind of like to see, you know, kind of like Abraham, you know, put your son Isaac on the altar and, and you know, sacrifice him. And I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be like, okay, Lord, I'll sacrifice my life for you. And here comes the knife. You know, okay, let me go back to the wood-turning art world now that I know all the stuff about the Bible. You don't want me in full-time ministry. You know, you don't want me in video ministry. And the Lord showed me that, yeah, that's actually what He wants for me. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, will I ever go back to the art world? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, the Lord's given me a lot of different talents over the years, and I give Him all the praise and glory for it. Uh, I can log. I can... I'm a certified motorcycle repair technician. Uh, I'm a wood turner, a wood carver, um, a professional chef for a while. If you've seen the video about my working history, I built boats. Um, I've had a very unique life. And uh, Romans 8.28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Uh, that's one of my life verses. And... Uh, so many things that were confusing about my past as a lost man. And uh, I, I haven't gotten into a lot of the stories about my lost life because there's no point in it. Um, that Brian is dead. And a lot of my relatives, they think I'm going to go back to that. They don't understand that he's dead, that he's gone, that he was buried, and a new Brian rose up with Christ. I have Jesus Christ living within me. I'm born again. Um, I didn't pray some prayer and save myself. I didn't uh, believe something and save myself. God saved me. And He purchased me. And He counted me faithful and put me into the ministry. Um, there's one thing that you can't say about Brian Denlinger, those of you my enemies out there, and that is you can't say that I'm wishy-washy and that I'm not blunt and I don't just come out with what I believe. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, what I believe. I'm going to preach the book. I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God and not worrying about uh, tiptoeing through the tithers. That's been, you know, when the Lord called me into the ministry, I, I determined in my mind, I thought, okay, Lord, if you really want me in this, I'm just going to, you know, no holds barred, nothing held back. I'm just going to come out with it. And if it gets me killed, fine. If it gets me in lots of trouble, fine, whatever. You're going to have to protect me. If you want me to do this, Lord, you protect me. And he's protected me and, and given me a, a dream life. It's very interesting because of the new property uh, that we got. Uh, it's just amazing how the Lord brings things full circle because not very far from our new property is the town of Patton in Maine. And there's a lumberman's museum there. I have a video up about that uh, showing that Lumberman's Museum and it all goes back to that old time woodworking stuff that I was so impressed by and I realized it helped me to realize the modern world is not it. Ask for the old paths. Amazing. The thing that started the salvation process in my life and I dreamed of having a property in the mountains and the old logging and all that other stuff and I go all these years later and I come back. You know, late 1990s basically is when I first started getting into a lot of this stuff. You know, the old woodsman ways and whatever else. There, and here I am, 2017 and into 2018 now, and the Lord's given me what I basically gave up way back when. I don't think I'm ever going to be a woodsman or have property in the mountains or whatever else. Well, here I am. I would have never thought that I was going to be married to a woman of, you know, my ethnicity and that the Lord would give us a child. I never thought I was going to have a child. I, you know, I'm just going to be a single guy. I was, you know, used to be Paul was my hero and I'd say I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul and, and whatever. And the Lord had different plans and I'm sure glad he did. Um, Serving the Lord is, is uh, yeah, I don't understand Christians, I, I, you know, professing Christians, and I'll hear them and they get frustrated and they say, you know, I was 
really tempted to leave the Lord. I don't, I don't understand that. I get tempted sometimes to leave the ministry, I'll tell you that. Uh, I get frustrated sometimes with people, but leaving the Lord, um, there's nowhere else to go. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't get that. And um, so I'm going to be with the Lord from now till the rapture, till the catching away, excuse me, I'll say the right term, till the time when he says, come up hither. Then I want to be going and then I'll be really good being with the Lord. Um, does he want me in ministry for the rest of the time? I have no idea. Uh, I guess when he stops giving me sermon ideas and, and uh, you know, if the whole body of Christ just cast my, out my name as evil and, and eventually says we're done with Brian Denlinger and there's better preachers out there to watch and whatever else, well, okay, I'll do something else. Um, this is not, this ministry here is not, I have to stay in ministry and, I'll, and I'm just going to compromise to do whatever I can to stay online and whatever. I'm not going to compromise. I will not compromise. I will not take money from Google. I'm not going to yoke up, up myself to papists of any kind, ever. I'm never going to get away from the King James Bible. It's the book of books. You will never, ever come on here and say, see Brian Denlinger saying, um, well, actually, I've been convinced now that the ESV or the NIV or the New American Standard or whatever else, I think that that's better or something. No, no. I'm going to be just as stubborn as I can. I'm not stubborn because of pride. I'm going to say I'm standing by the book no matter what happens. If it gets me kicked offline, if it gets me kicked out of ministry and people don't want to hear from me anymore, you know, okay. I'll do something else. I am not in this ministry for the money. Let me tell you that. I mean, I get that thing put on me. People say that, oh, you're in it for the money. If I was in it for the money, I'd be like some of the other fakers out there, joining myself up with people. God brought me to this point in, in my life because He saved me. He bought me with His blood. I really don't have a say in the matter, actually, if you want to be real honest about it. Brian Ellinger that used to have a say and do, did what he wanted to do, he died way back in 2002. And here I am 16 years later, almost probably to the day. I mean, it, I don't even know. This is the 7th of January. This could actually be the day I got saved 16 years ago. I don't know. But here I am. God brought me here. God controls my life. Does that mean I don't make mistakes? Of course I make mistakes. People don't seem to, to understand that. They think I'm supposed to be perfect and never make a mistake. That's not true. I make mistakes. But I'll correct myself when I'm wrong. Again, these people out there, the, the preachers that are so much better than me, show me where they come out and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Show me the videos where they say that they're wrong. I've never seen one. So I'll be here as long as the body of Christ wants me here, as long as the Lord, say it that way, as long as the Lord wants me here. But uh, the time is going to come, brethren, I believe, when, um, when people are not going to want the Word of God anymore. Um, I've seen so many people over the years. Uh, another thing I've learned about all my time in ministry, uh, over 10 years now, uh, you know, one thing I've learned is that uh, there's so many people that look like they're doing good and... Uh, you just see them, and I start to see them just kind of veer off a little bit, and before long I know it, boom, crash. And by God's grace, I'm not ever going to do that. I'm going to stand by the book, no matter what it costs me. So that's going to be it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the series of videos on the mat here. Two hours and 22 minutes. Well, what do you do? You know, um, I know my wife, she did uh, three parts for her testimony, and I don't know, this will probably end up being three parts, but uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, how do you sum up your life in just a few, you know, I'll just get it done in five minutes or something like that. Well, my quick testimony is I was a false convert from the time I was eight up until the time I was 26 years old. That's when the Lord finally broke my wicked life and brought me to my knees, literally, and I cried out to him to save me, and he heard my prayer, and the old man died. That old man 
just ceased to exist. Doesn't mean I became sinlessly perfect after then, as far as my own works and fleshly nature and whatever else. No, it just, things changed in my life. And God saved me. I was born again. And He changed my life. You going back to me when I was a teenager and said, hey, someday you're going to be a preacher known internationally all over the internet. You know, have so many people attacking you and it makes your head spin sometimes. I just said, what? Are you kidding me? Even when I first got saved, if you'd have told me I'd be doing what I'm doing right now, I'd have said, what? Here I am. So, thank you to everybody out there that sticks by the ministry. Uh, that really means a lot to us and uh, keeps us going. So, I uh, really have no plans to, to leave the ministry until the Lord says otherwise. Um, so, I thank you, everybody out there, for your friendship. Um, and uh, hopefully this has answered the thing of what's my testimony. Um, what a wonderful life in my change has been, or what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Think about that hymn. Very, very true. So, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and we will see you in upcoming videos.